Hello, everyone. I'm really glad to see you here. Thank you for the full audience. And uh, we have amazing guests today who do not need much introduction, but still. Uh, these are Ian Bremmer, world famous political analyst about the US politics, about states in transition, about political risks. Uh, the president and the founder of the Eurasia Group, the professor of Columbia University, and in his recent book, The Power of Crisis, he's analyzing the main global threats. And Bill Browder, the head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign, the co-founder of Heritage Capital Management, the former largest investor in Russia, and in his recent book, The Freezing Order, he discovers for the world the nature of Putin's kleptocracy and overall corruption in Russia, as far as I get it. So please, your applause for our guests. And the topic of our today's discussion is what lies ahead for Putin. And my first question, my first very, very short question is, he failed to take Kyiv in three days. He failed to change Ukrainian government within two weeks. The war is going on for 18 months. He faced the mutiny in his state, not successful, but still there was a mutiny, and he barely trusts anyone around him. So what do you think his state of mind is right now in, like, during this war and in these circumstances in Russia? Ian, would you please answer first? Um, far be it from me to be able to talk about what Putin thinks, right? Uh, but certainly this has been the largest misjudgment of any major leader on the global stage since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, this has gone very, very badly for him, uh, not just in terms of the war itself on the ground in Ukraine, but also in terms of the cohesion of NATO, in terms of the defense spending of the Europeans, in terms of the expansion of NATO to uh, be significantly greater along Russian borders, and also to the creation of Ukraine as the most powerful military in Europe. Um, so this is an enormous failure. Um, and what I think is happening to Russia is that they have gone from being a country in good standing in the G20 uh, to becoming a rogue state for the West. Not for India, not for Brazil, not for China, but for the West, a rogue state. And a rogue state means that if you ask, like, who's allied with Russia today, it's increasingly, well, Kim Jong-un, who's going to Vladivostok today yeah. to provide some weapons for Russia. It's the Iranians, it's Belarus, which is barely a country, it's Syria. And, and my concern is that making Russia into a rogue state, and, and it's Putin that's made Russia into a rogue state, it's not the West, it's not Ukraine, um, does create a significant longer term danger, especially for the Europeans writ large, because this is a new normal. We're, we're not, Russia is not suddenly gonna be a country that we can work with again. Ursula von der Leyen refers to Putin as a war criminal. Um, that, unfortunately, once you've created Putin as a dead-ender, uh, there are very few places to go. So l long term, we've got serious geopolitical challenges here. Thank you, Ian. We will come back to that later, about dead-ender and uh, European fears to be taken in mind. And Bill, uh, what's in his mind, do you think, because you know him as a person, I presume, but also, why do we think what is in his head rather than thinking what is in the West's head and on the Western civilization mind? Because as soon as we think what is in Putin's mind, we, we are still reactive, not proactive. Well, let, let me start by saying what's in Putin's yeah? mind. Raw panic. The guy is just absolutely terrified. And what is he terrified of? Um, well, he's living in a world where um, uh, you can't just uh, gracefully retire. There's no Putin presidential library uh, he can retire to and paint or do whatever he wants, enjoy all of his ill-gotten gains. 
if he loses power, um, he goes to jail, he loses his money, and he dies. And so, um, and and as and, and and we've seen it. There, there's like physical manifestations of this fear. You know, the uh, thirty foot table, the um, bunker, uh, all this kind of stuff. This is a scared little man. And by the way, the reason, um, in my opinion, that he went into Ukraine is that he was so scared that his people would somehow get rid of him that he needed to have a uh, sort of wag the dog. Uh, he needed to have a foreign enemy. And it's not the first time he's done it. He, Putin came into power uh, with the Chechen war. That's how he became president uh, in the year 2000, 1999. Um, in 2008, when his approval ratings were flagging, he went into Georgia, and of course, in 2014, he went into Crimea. Um, and he, he went into Ukraine to shore up his power. Um, as Ian said, it hasn't worked in the most spectacular, non-working way. And the trouble is that he has no, there's no ability, he has no ability to compromise, negotiate, or back down. For him, it's all or nothing. If he backs down, um, somebody more uh, nationalistic will, will step up and say that that person should be president, not Putin. And we saw a little bit of that with, with uh, Prigozhin. Um, and there, therefore, um, uh, this fantasy we have uh, that there is going to be, that we, we should have diplomacy, not war. Well, you, the only way to have diplomacy is if somebody wants to be diplomatic, wants to have a conversation. He doesn't want to have a conversation. And the Ukrainians don't want to have a conversation that, that um, includes anything other than his removal and, and the regaining of their territory. And so um, what's in his mind is, is a stubborn move forward, and they're about to draft somewhere between uh, 300 and 700,000 more people to, for this war. Um, uh, and what's in the mind of, of the West and the Ukrainians is, is to um, fight him and, and keep on fighting him. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Ian, let's go back to you. As Bill said, uh, Putin came in power with Chechnya war and then the NATO summit refused to take on Ukraine and Georgia and then he immediately invaded Georgia and then in a few years he invaded Ukraine in Donbas and Crimea, but it's still Ukraine. And uh, now we have a full-scale war. And now there is like a circle of thoughts that oh, NATO doesn't want to be in the direct conflict with Russia, but Ukraine wants to join NATO, and it's non comil for to support Russia, we all support Ukraine, but at the same time, we don't want to make Putin more angry. And as you said, uh, Russia is becoming a rogue state. So what's going to the world do with this rogue state, and I know in one of your previous interviews you said that Russia might become a rogue state for the whole world as Iran was for the Middle East, but I presume Russia cannot be dealt with like Iran. So what's the way to deal with this rogue state? Are we still, are we just waiting? What, what does it do next? Or? Well, well, first of all, the Prigozhin point is a very important one uh, because um, irrespective of what's going on inside Putin's head. And again, I, I'm not in a position to make that call. Bill's closer to, than most people in the West to having some of that actual assessment. Um, but we do know what Putin actually did when he was really threatened at home. When Prigozhin and his merry band decided to go from Rostov up towards Moscow. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, th this is a fairly existential threat for a dictator like Putin. And he didn't, you know, suddenly go in with guns blaring. He, he cut a deal. In other words, in a position of, of really bad timing for Putin with, you know, the, what would have been the need to start, like, fighting around Moscow, potentially revealing that he had fled to go to St. Petersburg at the time, <laughs> with troops that would have needed to leave from Ukraine to get redeployed to Russia. He didn't do that. He instead cut a deal with Prigozhin. He backed down a feint until he got himself in a better position, froze Wagner's assets, closed down their media company, um, disarmed, took the heavy arms away from Prigozhin's top people, and then a couple months later, he had him killed. Right? Yeah. Um, 
NATO is paying attention to that. NATO is seeing that when Putin really gets hit hard, suddenly he's not like launching a nuke. He's focusing on personal and regime survival. And, and for better or for worse, again, I'm not making a judgment here, I'm just giving analysis, you now have the Americans feeling much more comfortable about providing F-16s. The Americans feeling much more comfortable at providing long-range attack missile systems to the Ukrainians. These were things that Biden and his advisors six months ago would have said this could lead to World War III. They no longer believe that. By the way, is this the World War III? No, it's not World War III, but of course not. Of course it's not World War III, but um, it is absolutely a proxy war that is occurring in Ukraine with the West providing troops, uh, excuse me, the West training troops, providing intelligence, providing material, and the rest. So Ukraine's- Sorry, what do you mean by the proxy war here? In, in the sense that you know, Ukraine is getting an enormous capacity to continue to fight and defend themselves and retake their territory from the West. And the willingness of the West to provide those, we those weapon systems has gone up in part just because the war is going on and so it's like the boiling frog, a little more, a little more, a little more, you keep doing it. In part because Putin is no longer seen as credible uh, in, in terms of responding to a threat against himself. He's already lost a lot and his response has not been massive escalation. So I, I think the willingness of the West to keep going on this is quite high with the exception of a very big question mark over what happens in the US in the 2024 election and whether or not Trump, who will likely be the nominee, wins office. Because if he does, um, then the American support for Ukraine uh, will diminish dramatically. Uh, and and that, that is something that clearly Putin is very, very hopeful for going forward. Thank you, Ian. Let's continue from here. If the power in America changes in a way that the weapon support declines dramatically and Ukraine founds itself in a position that, yes, there are only Ukrainian troops fighti fighting in Ukraine. There are no foreign troops, whatever. And if Ukraine is short of weapons, what happens next? Maybe, he, maybe that's really what he is waiting for. There, there's no question that, that, that Putin, so Putin is lost in every possible way. You know, the, Russia was supposed to be the second most powerful uh, military in the world. They're now the second most powerful military in Ukraine. Um, he, he, he's, he's lost, um, uh, according to Ukrainian statistics, and I believe them, he's lost like 270,000 soldiers dead, and there's probably three times as many disabled. And so like a million people have been taken out of commission. Um, he, um, uh, he's, he, they're now, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un is coming from North Korea um, to supply weapons. Um, the, the Russians getting weapons from the North Koreans, that's a sign of just desperation in my mind. And so um, uh, he's, he's, his, his big Hail Mary, like his, you know, the whole thing that he's hoping for is that somehow um, we fold um, before he, he folds. And, um, uh, and he does have a lot more, he, can, he doesn't have a, a, an electorate or a press or a judiciary or anything to worry about. He can, he can literally throw another million men into battle and he will. Um, but everything, you know, his resources are, are, are being stretched. Um, uh, the, a, a lot of things are not working out. And so he's hoping and praying that um, November 2024 comes around and, and Trump gets elected. Because if Trump gets elected, America, Trump is not going to support uh, Ukraine. America supplies the majority of the military and financial aid for Ukraine. And that's his, his hope and his, his dream. And what's then? Well, then, then um, Ukraine is going to have to, I, I mean, does Europe then fold? Um, no. Uh, does Ukraine fold? Definitely not. Uh, you, but um, it all depends on, you know, the, the war depends on, on uh, sort of, uh, military capability. And if, they, if the Ukrainians don't have the military capability, what happens when the Ukrainians run out of air defense? You know, what happens at some point, there, there may be a point where um, if, if America folds on this thing, that um, Ukraine is going to be forced to negotiate. And, um, and that would be a terrible, terrible thing 
not just for Ukraine. Of course, we know what happens um, to places that the Russians occupy. We've seen um, when, when those places have been liberated, we know what happens to the people in those places. The women are raped, the men are castrated, the children are taken away. Um, uh, that's what happens in Ukraine. And of course, Putin then can rearm um, and then yeah. get himself ready for the next move. And so it's, that would be a terrible disaster for Ukraine. It would be a terrible disaster for the rest of the world. And then we'd have to start worrying about uh, Article 5 of NATO. Would, would, if, if, uh, if Russia goes after Estonia or Poland and Trump is president, um, what happens then? Does um, Russia is not going for Poland or Lithuania right now. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Ian, I would like to come back to you. You said earlier that uh, Russia is an existential threat for Europe. At the same time, there are a lot of people in Europe who are saying, this is not my war. This is just because my utility bills became higher. This is why my strawberry jam costs more. This is because of you, Ukrainians, that what my friends across Europe are hearing. And what is the key fact about Putin, which Europeans have to know to understand why is it the existential threat for them? Well, look, the Europeans uh, believed that the peace dividend was going to last. Uh, the Americans uh, were less affected by it, but the Europeans were not spending much on defense for 30 years, uh, and now they are. So first, there's going to be a significant cost under already challenging fiscal budgets going forward post-pandemic with relatively high inflation, where suddenly they have to make room for, for increased defense spending. So that's a downside for the EU uh, for the coming years. Number two, energy prices are higher. Strawberry jam is higher. I mean, the agricultural trade that came from Europe, uh, from Russia, uh, de minimis in the United States, significant in Europe. The gas, significant in Europe. That is a structural higher level of investment and cost that will be borne by Europeans across the board. And many will be angry as a consequence of that. And then third, the reality that Russia engaged in asymmetric warfare is not just about a couple of villagers in Poland that get killed uh, when um, Ukrainian air defense uh, lands on them. It's not just about Romania that gets hit by a Russian drone. Drones. It's also about disinformation. It's about cyber attacks, it's about involvement in the elections, which will play a bigger role across Europe than it will in the United States. This is a reality. It's espionage. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, Russians going from Belarus to Poland. It's all of this stuff. So this is a reality. Now, I want to briefly talk, touch on uh, what you were just discussing with Bill, which is what happens if the Americans yep. withdraw support from Ukraine? Because we all should recognize that's a 20 or 30 or 40 percent likelihood in the coming year. This is a big deal. It's the biggest uncertainty right now, period, in the war. I, I think that things could go in very different directions. So number one, Ukraine is increasingly going to be one of the most important producers of advanced drones in the world. Millions and millions of drones. Ukrainian production, which will not have restrictions on where they can launch those drones into Russia, into Russia proper, and with large enough numbers that they will be able to overwhelm Russian defenses. So first, Ukraine may find that they are in a position that they need to go escalate themselves because they're losing support from the West. They have to go all in. Why? Because they're in an existential war against Russia. So they're not going to give up. I mean, against Ukraine first, I would say. Ukraine first. <laughs> Ukraine first. But I'm just saying, you're already seeing more drone strikes on Russia. So the first is that the Ukrainians could, the Americans pulling out could precipitate the Ukrainians to escalate. The second point is they could be forced to sue for peace. And that's accepted. Um, and the Russians, Putin is resurgent. And then there are bigger threats on and on to Poland, to the rest of the Baltic states. The third is that Zelensky tries to sue for peace. He fails internally. He's taken out. And Ukraine doesn't have effective governance. And then we've seen how it plays. The Americans, right now, we are at peak NATO. The United States and its allies are coordinating in extraordinary and exemplary fashion for the last year and a half plus Historically, the willingness to bet on the Americans to actually follow through long term on war plans is not necessarily a great bet. And, and if peak NATO becomes much weaker over time, then we have much bigger questions. 
about what level of instability in this part of the world we end up getting. Right? Um, so I, I'm, I, I think that there are very, very existential questions to be asked about the future of Ukraine and Europe versus Russia in the next two to five years. Yeah, the only thing which I can say here as Ukrainian is that I barely can imagine Zelensky just asking for the peace negotiations because he is publicly declaring that never ever before the state borders are all reached That's by why the Ukrainian I didn't start army. With that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Bill. Before you comment on what Ian said, I just would like to ask you, again, as a person who might understand his state of mind, when I hear the next level of the Western military, about the next level of Western military aid to Ukraine, and I discuss it with my British or German or French friends, I always hear the question, but Nina, what if he escalates? And under the escalates word, they mean the nuclear button. Do you think he, given that, given how did we deal with Prigozhin is a very, in a very covert FSB style way, is he gonna push this button ever or he's not brave enough or not mad enough? Um, well, so Putin has no, um, uh, he, he, he has no em sense of empathy. He can't, uh, he, he could he could kill a million children and it wouldn't he wouldn't sleep any worse at night. So, I mean, he has the emotional capacity to do it. Um, the 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 big question is um, if he did it, how would it help him? Would he? So if he, let's say that they he nuked Kharkiv and killed everybody there, um, would all of a sudden the rest of Ukraine surrender? Uh, no, of course not, because um, we, uh, so the Ukrainians wouldn't surrender, so that wouldn't solve his military goals. And what happens to the Chinese and the Indians and all these people that were all so nice to him recently, um, Blula offering him to come to the next G20? Um, I, I suspect that if he used a nuclear weapon explicitly, um, he'd no longer be invited to any more international meetings and he'd probably be more isolated than North Korea. Um, also, if he uses a nuclear weapon, which way does the wind blow? Um, the, it, it probably blows east. Um, uh, and then, of course, NATO can't just say, oh, he's used a nuclear weapon, that's Ukraine, none of our business. Um, the moment that's, that, that a nuclear-armed country uses a nuclear weapon, there has to be some kind of consequence. There, maybe it's not a nuclear reaction, but uh, General Petraeus has this whole laundry list of things that would happen. I, I, he knows more than I do. He says they would immediately, the West, NATO would immediately sink the Black Sea fleet. We would then decimate all the Russian soldiers on the ground in Ukraine in, in conventional fashion, et cetera. Um, so none of that's a particularly good um, outcome for Putin. Um, and and I, if, I believe if he were to do that, that would be the end of Putin. Having said that, there's a lot of other things that he can do. And yet, as you mentioned, he's a, he's a KGB guy. He, he, you know, he didn't you know, have a gun battle with Prigozhin on the way into Moscow. He waited for two months and figured out and then shot his plane out of the sky. And so, uh, uh, you know, there, there's the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. There could be an accident there. Um, or, or all sorts of stuff that we, don't, we haven't even thought about. The, the whole dam blowing up was something we didn't think about, and that was the biggest environmental disaster that's occurred in Europe. We've all forgotten about it very quickly. But, and still is. Um, uh, yep. But Putin has got a lot of things up his sleeve that could be really nasty, plausibly deniable, escalatory, ruining Ukraine, um, and, and, and very plausible. And if you look at his history, you know, you, you look at what he did in Syria, you look at what he did in Chechnya, um, he could, his strategy could just be to try to flatten all of Ukraine in a, in a conventional way, which, which happens on the margin incrementally, and, and that would be a success for him. And so there's a lot of nasty stuff he can do. He's got a lot of capacity to do it, and I wouldn't in any way expect that he wouldn't use these tools and these, these tactics up to um, uh, an explicit binary nuclear attack. Yeah, thank you, Bill. So to summarize, we've got one minute left on our clock, but... I think we can take two short questions. Please introduce yourself and tell to whom your question would be. Please, just wait for the mic. I'm David Wood, Chair of London Futurist. My question is about possible regime change inside Russia. Are the levers that the rest of the world can pull to make such a regime change more likely, more economic uh, uh, restrictions, for example? Or is such an uh, idea dangerous because we might get somebody even worse than Putin? <laughs> to whom is your question addressed? 
Whoever is brave. Whoever. Yeah, is it? I'll start. Um, look, I, I, I think that um, there, there is uh, no reason to believe that the replacement of Putin is someone like Boris Nemtsov um, or, or Mr. Navalny, uh, uh, someone who would be more engaged with the West. Uh, the, the, the view that the West uh, has been uh, created an effort to humiliate Russia and is an implacable enemy uh, is a story that Putin has been pushing for a long time that is increasingly and broadly shared among those that are potential aspirants for power. Um, I'm also someone who believes that there is very low likelihood that Putin is taken out until the day that it happens. So, um, in other words, you know, we all saw when Prigozhin was marching on Moscow, there were no oligarchs that were defecting. There were no ministers or generals that were saying, hey, 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 I'm out too, let's go. Putin, I think Bill and I both agree on this, uh, Prigozhin being out uh, implies stronger control of Putin over the so-called Siloviki, the security vertical in Russia. Hard to imagine meaningful challenges to him in the near term. Also, the Russian economy is, is performing okay. It's not great, and long term they're in serious trouble, but their ability to keep on keeping on uh, for the next one, two, three years is not something we should underestimate. Yeah. So. Let me just add one thing to Ian, which is that the best way to get rid of Putin is for the Ukrainians to expel Russia from their territory. If that happens, um, he, he, Putin can't lose in Ukraine and continue to be the leader of Russia. And so that, that's, that's our best strategy, which is to do more of what we're doing, but to not just um, tie one hand behind have them tie one hand behind their back by not giving them the, the, the military tools they're asking but, for. Sorry, but do you believe in democracy in Russia? I mean, can you, can you imagine an uh, ele elec electoral process when they say, oh, he didn't win in Ukraine, we won't elect him, let's select somebody else. Whom will you, choosing, who will you be choosing from? Well, I, mean, I think there will be a total chaos if, if they lose the war, and I think that the, the anger of the losses that, that have been experienced may bubble over and... Um, it could be a disorderly transfer of power, and, and um, uh, I, I just want to—I agree with everything Ian said, but one thing, which is, it, it, we can't rule out that that Russia want Russia's the Russians want a reasonable person to run the country. It, yes, it's very, very likely that a that a hardcore nationalist will be the one taking over, but it's also there is some. The, the, I, I could draw the, the line, be, you know, there, there's, one, there's one political, real po politician in Russia right now, um, opposition politician, and that's Alexei Navalny. He's, he's sitting in jail. He's, he's somebody who's very popular. And if you had a Mubarak type of situation, where, when Mubarak was disappeared, they needed to find somebody else. They, in, in, in Egypt, they didn't have somebody else, and they chose the Muslim Brotherhood. In Russia, they do have someone else, which is a real politician, a real popular person, Navalny. I see Navalny um, as someone who would be liked by a lot of young people in like Moscow, but would not remotely get a free and open vote uh, in Russia across the board. Uh, but I also think, I agree, completely agree with Bill, the best way to get rid of Putin is for the Ukrainians to win and take all the territory back. It is important to recognize that NATO leaders right now, military leaders increasingly do not believe that is going to happen. So this is, that doesn't mean they don't want it to happen. They just don't believe it will. So it's important for us to recognize that assessment as it stands right now. So then how might it end? Or it is endless, uh, and this is new normal, and then? No, wait, wait, wait. New nor hard to say new normal because neither of us believe that this is very stable right now. Uh, but also, the last six months, there's been virtually no land that's changed hands. This is right now mostly an entrenched defensive fight, and a lot of troops on both sides are getting chewed up, a lot of equipment getting chewed up as well. Um, the U Ukrainians increasingly getting a lot of very advanced materiel, but the Ukrainians also, I mean, Poland, the troops in Poland that were being, uh, the, the recruits that were being trained in the first few months of the war, the average age was 26. The average age now is in the 40s, well into the 40s, because Ukraine's a country of only 44 million people. So they're also experiencing challenges as the war is continuing to go on. I, 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 it's hard to imagine that this is an endless war. Someone's going to break first. We just don't know who's going to break. Yeah. Um, we've got 30 seconds left. Just one very short question, please. Introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, Rod Banner. I, I am here to uh, attend an AI conference, and one of the things that really fascinates me is this fixation that Donald Trump is going to become the Republican nominee, and he's going to win. And most of the, th the things that seem to propel people like him to success in democracies, 
are largely rooted in the lack of truth in social media. So here we have a new power um, with generative the AI. The question is, is it conceivable that AI could change the outcome in the US election in such a way that perhaps we'll continue with support and therefore win this war? Thank you. Yes, no, short answers. <laughs> Let me just say one thing, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that nobody should predict US politics because it all gets determined six months before the election. If you remember, Joe Biden wasn't even in like the top five candidates um, among the de mm -hmm. Democrats. No one had ever heard of Barack Obama. Um, Donald Trump, uh, uh, Jeb Bush was supposed to be the Republican nominee. It turned out to be Donald Trump. And so everybody that's basically, you know, if, if these people were fund managers, they'd be the worst fund managers because they just look at past performance to make future predictions. I think that everything is in play. We don't know whether Joe Biden will be well enough to run. He may decide in November not to run, and then we have a dem different Democratic candidate. We don't, we don't know whether Donald Trump will be disallowed from running. We, there's just so many different uncertainties that, um, yes, it's scary. Yes, the, the, it's like 20, 30 percent chance that something terrible happens, but there's a lot of other uh, different outcomes on this decision tree. Um. Ian, you mentioned yeah. in your book that there are three main global threats, the COVID-19 consequences, climate change, and new technologies. Interestingly, you didn't mean Russia as a global threat, which you're obviously doing now, I think, but would it affect the world politics? Yeah, um, I mean... The, the artificial the, intelligence. The, yeah, I do believe that artificial intelligence is a more fundamental threat to democracies than it is to authoritarian regimes. So I, I, I did this book back in 2006 called The J-Curve, and it looked at the relationship between a country's stability and its openness. And the idea was that countries that are stable because they're open, like the UK or the US, are more stable than countries that are stable because they're closed, like Russia and China. I will say that in part, one of the variables that drove that was the fact that technology was decentralizing and was about the communications revolution. It undermined authoritarian regimes. It strengthened democracies. We saw that with the colored revolutions in Ukraine, in Georgia. We saw that with even the beginnings of the Arab Spring. Today, technology is not bottom up. It's top down, it's the data revolution, it's the surveillance revolution, it's about AI. It's in the hands of a small number of corporations and governments, and it allows them to better determine outcomes for themselves. To my mind, if I were writing the J-curve again today, it looks more like a U. Countries that are stable because they're closed increasingly are trending towards being as stable as countries that are stable because they're open, maybe even flipping the script, God forbid, over the next five to 10 years. So I am deeply concerned about where this trend is heading in undermining what is truth what is civil society, airing grievances. I feel like I should be voting for this, irrespective of what I think, what I know. Trump's is a grievance-based campaign. His support is strong on that basis. That's why 91 indictments against him have convinced, his, his popularity has only gone up since those indictments because that is proving to his core supporters that they are out to get him, you see? It, it's not analytically based, it's grievance based. And, and AI is really good at channeling grievance and outrage to get you to pay more attention and click more. And, and authoritarian governments can use that for their purposes. Democratic governments are almost irrelevant to that process being driven by corporations for profitability. That's a very serious challenge in my view. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I see five more minutes on our clock and any women like to, five more minutes, to right? ask we're, we're here. the question? I see men only. Let's, let's make some gender balance, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead. Um, we need... We need we're being shut down. We are shutting down. Sorry. Then <laughs> I hope you will ask your question Let's later. The last Ladies one. and gentlemen, no, thank you very much. Ian Bremer, Bill Browder, thank you.